All right, it's high noon at CoinFest and Chris is the sheriff, so I hope I don't upset him with what I'm about to say. So, um, yeah, I'm uh, Wasim. I'm an independent researcher in the space. Uh, I've fallen down the cryptocurrency rabbit hole a number of years ago. And, uh, you know, being a kind of classically trained nerd, uh, it's kind of expected that I've ended up uh, knee deep in the, in the finicky details of all of this stuff. So I want to draw your attention first to the picture on the screen. This is a picture I snapped myself in uh, Shenzhen, which is just across the border from Hong Kong. It's the Chinese Silicon Valley. And um, I was there just before Christmas. And there's a, there's a district called Huakang Bay. I may be saying that wrong. Um, and it's kind of like a boulevard with tower blocks all around it. And each of those buildings has a different kind of electronics vertical in it. It might be computer components. It might be mobile phone components. It might be ASICs and GPUs and, and all the rest of it. And so somebody took me around there that knew, knew the place. And we weren't really looking for mining equipment. Or, or cryptocurrency related stuff, but it was everywhere, like uh, unsold, overstock inventory, ant miner stuff everywhere, uh, closed down uh, Bitmain shop on the high street. It was really uh, eye-opening to see, to see that stuff, like the, the um, change in the market cycles hits some parts of the, of the industry and the ecosystem uh, harder than others. So what was great was I was just about to give the first iteration of this talk in, uh, in Hong Kong. And I saw this picture and I thought, well, I've already given the, the talk a salacious title. So now I've got my kind of salacious image of these like, young, glamorous people holding their ASICs as if uh, that might make people want to get into mining a bit more. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. If, I don't think it's working, I'll be honest. OK, so really a little bit about me. I, uh, I was a kind of science kid. So I, um, did chemistry, physics, astronomy, that kind of stuff at uni. Uh, spent way too long there. Then I got into experimental arts. So I used to run a record label, curate a festival, um, organize events around Europe, take uh, weird, wonderful projects to art galleries, things like that. And then, uh, yeah, fell down the cryptocurrency rabbit hole. You may notice some uh, interesting images in, uh, in my talk. I have, uh, I've cornified my talk, and that's uh, on the request of Theo Goodman. I'm very disappointed that he's not here. Uh, so, yeah, he'll have, he'll have hell to pay for that. OK, so the first thing we'll, we'll touch on, just to set the scene a bit, is about you know, why we think that uh, cryptocurrency matters. Now, I don't think I have to motivate this crowd too much. I think you know, we're all here because uh, we're already motivated by this stuff. So, yeah, the existing systems don't seem to be working that well. The governments, the power structures, the currencies, the corporations, these things do not seem to have the best interests of the common person uh, at heart. So the great potential I see in these technologies, among other things, is the potential for us to uh, tilt the balance of, of power, tilt the balance of, of, of uh, the situation back in favor of the individual at the expense of institutions or governments or whoever else. I think they've had quite, quite a long run of, of things. So um, we use these words. Decentralization, uh, permissionlessness, censorship resistance, immutability. Um, but we don't always qualify them. Now, Tom gave a talk, Tom from Commerce Book gave a talk this morning, and he did a really good job of uh, um, anchoring the word immutability and, uh, in, some, you know, in some definitions. And so this is a kind of a network, stack of layers approach to characterizing your typical cryptocurrency network. And um, when you use these kind of OSI type stack of layer models, you can then start to talk about things like decentralization with reference to the layers. So if you talk about logical decentralization, you're talking about the architecture of the data structure, you know, blockchain or a database or, or a DLT or whatever you want to call it. Every time the, somebody says the word DLT, I always think of a sandwich. I still haven't quite, haven't quite got it yet, but anyway. So if we talk about protocol decentralization, then we're talking about things like the distribution of the nodes in the network and whether one set of nodes has preferential access or preferential treatment or additional responsibilities than, than another. Monetary decentralization, we could be talking about things like the Gini coefficient, where we look at the distribution of the money in a network, who has the coins, how concentrated is the wealth or the, or the asset supply. And the social political decentralization is kind of related to this a uh, very timely topic of uh, blockchain governance, where you know who has the real power, who makes these decisions, how do how do things get implemented, how do um, the different stakeholders in the networks come to agreement and figure out what to do. Okay, and then you know when we have this stack of layers, we can also talk about, um, for example, permissionlessness. 
So permissionlessness, you could say it's something that relates to the social layer. So there's no uh, subset of people which are prevented from using the network. Censorship resistance, you could talk of it as a primarily protocol layer uh, phenomenon where the um, network or the, the protocol uh, doesn't favor or doesn't uh, offer preferential treatment to any one subset of, of stakeholders or, or any uh, type of transaction. Okay, let's, uh, let's roll on. So we're gonna talk about apples to apples comparisons in a sea of fruit salad. So all of these networks are different. All of these coins and tokens and protocols are different. And so when you hear people say, my coin's better than yours, I think X is decentralized and Y isn't. Um, it's very hard to objectively compare these things because they're sui generis, they're, they're each unique in their own right. So what I've tried to do is find the things that are most similar to each other so we can try to make some informed comparisons. So this project is called uh, Forkonomy with uh, reference to astronomy. So what the hell is Forkonomy? And we're gonna draw an analogy to astronomy. So what's astronomy? We take the light from stars far away and it passes through space. Now space isn't really a vacuum, there's a bit of stuff there. Not much, but there is stuff. So the light passes through space, it interacts with the things that are there. And by the time it reaches us, there may be some kind of fingerprints, some signatures, some differences in the light from when it left. And then from there we can make some inferences as to what might be in that um, medium that, that's passed through. And we can use, um, simulation or we can do experiments on the ground to try and correlate what we observe with what we might expect to see and then we might do some number crunching to try and um, predict what we might see in other environments to try and do some you know, predictive analysis. Now this thing in the bottom right hand corner of the slide is called the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram and this is a kind of a stellar taxonomy. So what Hertzsprung and Russell did was they correlated the brightness of a star and the temperature of its surface, and they found these relationships that could successfully predict with a very high degree of accuracy the future, probable future fates of those stars. So whether a star is so big that it will collapse in on itself and become a neutron star or a black hole, or whether it will fail to um, maintain its gravitational influence on its outer layers and it will kind of uh, turn into a cold, lifeless rock, a white dwarf. Okay, that doesn't seem very related to blockchains, but bear with me. So we can take it a step further, and we see uh, your friend of mine, Isaac Newton here, uh, diffracting some light into its constituent wavelengths, into its constituent components. And the parallel I like to draw here is that we can use uh, data analysis, statistical methods, to try and get a little bit more finer grain insights into what's happening in these networks as compared to the kind of basic phenomenology of what's happening on the surface. And this is something that I did a very long time ago when I was a master's student. Uh, I, I, um, I was an astrochemist at the time. We were doing experiments on Earth to try and reproduce the conditions in space. And you don't need to read anything more into this than like look at some cool pictures. We, we did some fun experiments and kind of looks like a weather map. But the idea is that we can do something here, you know, far away or like indirect, you know, without the benefit of direct observation to gain some insights and inferences into what might be going on. All right. So what forkonomy isn't, it's not a kind of comprehensive catalogue of all the different kinds of forks that might be able to happen. Uh, that's the sort of goal that people can move towards once we have a kind of basic understanding. So um, in ontology, like a kind of the science of meaning, is kind of like the last step uh, of, of, uh, of the pursuit of wisdom and knowledge. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later, but I definitely don't think we're there yet with this uh, cryptocurrency stuff. We're still very much in the opening stages of figuring out what the hell is going on here. All right, so we've heard about forks, cryptocurrency network forks, blockchain forks, chain splits, hard forks, soft forks, velvet forks. Um, so we use the word fork and it can mean many things. So it's always helpful to try and um, zone in a little bit and differentiate between the different kinds of phenomena that this word is, is referred to. So the first thing, the easiest thing to understand is a code base fork. So we all know that um, Bitcoin was the first cryptocurrency and then you know, from that garden a thousand flowers have bloomed. So Litecoin is a code base fork of Bitcoin. Zcash was a code base fork of Bitcoin with some additional cryptographic uh, constructions. Uh, Dash put masternodes in uh, and so on. And so you can think of um, this by reference to the Linux code base, to the open source operating system 
uh, from GNU, GNU Linux, which uh, Linus Torvalds came up with in the early 90s, and now there's countless thousands of descendants of this, uh, of this network. So these are kind of like family trees. These are genealogically related um, by the similarities and differences of their code. And there's a really cool paper. Um, Sarah Mecklejohn is one of the authors, and it's called When is a Raven Coined Like a Token Desk? Where they're trying to look at the gene genealogical similarities of the code and where the code's kind of filtered through all of these different steps of these different forks uh, as time's gone on. On the right, we have what you could call the code base for economy of the crypto note family. So the first uh, crypto note coin was Bytecoin. And then uh, from there, the more famous, most famous one is, is Monero. Um, and uh, from there, you know, many other people think there's probably a new crypto note coin every week these days. And so you can think of these things as kind of like distinct families or, or distinct um, uh, subgroups of, of coins. Hmm. What a break. So, in contrast to that, you've got this idea of ledger forks. So the code base fork is kind of like a copy and paste. It's a static process. A ledger fork is a dynamic process. We've got the network live, and then something happens, and we've gone from one network to two networks. And so um, that's a picture from my lunch one day with this uh, you know, si Siamese carrot. And so you might have a change in the rule set when one subset of nodes decides to change the rules, let's say they want to make the base block size bigger or they want to change the proof of work algorithm or something like that. And so you'll get this uh, fragmentation of the network. One set of nodes will go one way, another set of nodes will go the other, and the one, the one chain that existed before will now diverge into two different chains. And so one of the most common um, causes of these kinds of, of, of chain splits is a uh, change in the parameters or the, or the consensus um, specification of a network. And uh, there's a bunch of phenomena that you might observe that we've seen in networks, like when Ethereum became Ethereum and Ethereum Classic, when Bitcoin became Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash, uh, things like replay attacks, uh, chain reorganizations, and wipeouts. I won't go into them in, in too much detail. They, they've, been, um, they've been covered in, in great detail before. And it's always helpful to think about the difference between what a hard fork is and a soft fork and you know, other kinds of, of things. But Paul Stortz has done some great work on trying to kind of go into a bit more detail about the different kinds of forks and, and how they might be um, distinguished uh, apart. So a hard fork is usually where the consensus rules are loosened. So something that was previously invalid is now valid. So think about a block size increase. Um, you know, if from when Bitcoin um, went from one megabyte to Bitcoin Cash is eight megabytes, you could now put a four megabyte block in and that would be valid, whereas before it wouldn't have been. Soft fork is usually a constriction or a, um, a further specificity within the existing rules. So some people in Bitcoin are talking about reducing the block size right now. They think that the initial block download and the size of the chain will prevent people from running full nodes. And uh, you know they have a point, they may be right, I don't know. But so uh, Luke Dash Jr. runs a um, Bitcoin client called Knots, and I believe the maximum block size in Knots, or the default maximum block size in Knots is 350 kilobytes. And so because 350 kilobytes is still within the base block limit of Bitcoin of one megabyte, you're not violating any consensus rules. So anyone, I mean, can make the, the blocks whatever size they want as long as they're within the limit. And it's funny to think that now the narrative is that small blocks would help the network, whereas before people were annoyed at uh, Antminer and Ant, sorry, Antpool for mining empty blocks. So the, the, there's a very subjective lens of how we look at the actions of the stakeholder participants in the network and whether they're uh, good or bad. All right. So this slide contains a few pictures that are very similar to copyrighted TV and movie shows to do with time travel and parallel dimensions. And that's kind of the analogy that I'd like us to stick with when we look at these, uh, these for, the uh, ledger forks of these networks, that these... Um, uh, when, a, when a chain splits into two or more uh, you know, children, these are kind of like A-B tests of reality. I guess most of the people in this room have probably seen Back to the Future. So remember Back to the Future 2, where uh, Biff um, finds the... Um, uh, Biff, future Biff hands past Biff the almanac, and then he bets on everything correctly, and he becomes Donald Trump. I mean, a very important person. Um, so those are kind of like these parallel universes. These are kind of like chain splits of, of reality. So let's try to keep that in mind. OK, and so the way blockchain works, right, we, we have a block, and then people are looking for another block, whether that's proof of work, it's, it's people cycling through nonces to find 
an acceptably low hash, or it's um, you know, validators on a, on a proof of X, proof of stake type network, um, there's the possibility that more than one candidate block that fulfills the rules will be found. And then there might be a race to propagate that across the network. So those are kind of like transient chain splits in a way. You've kind of got two possible futures there. And uh, whichever one the network decides on is what will be then built upon. Now, this is happening all the time in something like uh, Ethereum with a very short block time. There's constantly multiple candidate blocks. And that's why uh, Ethereum type chains give rewards to what they call uh, uncles or orphan blocks, just to, make, to uh, incentivize miners uh, to keep uh, going. Even if they don't find the block that people build on, they still get some you know, participation trophy or silver medal. So, so what, what's the difference between a transient chain split and a long-lived network fragment, minority network fragment? And I would argue it's a lot of it is to do with the support of the stakeholders, the people and the entities that um, hold sway, that have influence in these networks. So this is a really interesting example from the, day, the early days of Ethereum Classic. Um, and I gave this talk at the Ethereum Classic Summit um, six or seven months ago. It's quite funny because I was warning them about the frailties of being a minority proof of work network, but I didn't think for a moment that Ethereum Classic would be a chain that would get 51% attacked and you know, people would be double spending that on exchanges. It didn't really seem that likely that such a large proof of work network, the second largest F hash network, would, um, would be susceptible to that. But anyway, so this gentleman is named Chandler Guo, and he supposedly has a very large GPU mining farm. So from one week to the next, he was saying that he hates Ethereum Classic and he's going to kill it with his 6,000 GPUs. And then the next week he's saying he's going to defend it. So, I mean, things like that with people spinning on a dime, they make a big difference. So with the case of ETC in particular, you had um, Grayscale uh, Digital Currency Group, Barry Silbert and his, and his uh, stakeholders come out in support of, of ETC. You had um, Wiz, one of his very early Bitcoin miners. He almost single-handedly kept uh, ETC alive in the early days, uh, apparently. Um, and so you need some help. And uh, here's some... Here's some pictures of some famous people uh, that were around in the early days of Ethereum. And uh, there was a little bit of a schism. And now uh, Charles Hoskinson and IOHK are developing on ETC rather than Ethereum Classic, as well as uh, Cardano and Zencash and, and other projects. So I think you, you need some help. Otherwise, your network is not going to survive. You know, this, this transient fork is just going to uh, wither on the vine, like this deconstructed uh, Bitcoin card. Right, so I don't want to go into this too much. I'm sure you're all very familiar with Bitcoin politics. And this slide, this slide's quite old. So this is before the latest schism. Um, so, so yeah, I won't go into this too much. But um, you know, having people or entities with resources to support your network, to, to defend it with hash power, or to you know, media outlets or mining pools, these things make a big difference. They make a really big difference. OK, so this thing is what I call a chain dynamics visualization. On the x-axis, we have uh, chain time, block height. On the y-axis, we have the wall, wall time, you know, the time on your calendar. And so we're looking at the, the rate of the blocks coming in. So this is kind of like looking at the interblock time, the time between blocks, trying to use that as a proxy heuristic for the health of the network. The blue line is Bitcoin. The red line is Bitcoin Cash. That blue line looks pretty straight. So that looks like a reasonably healthy network. Blocks are being found, blocks are being propagated, more blocks being found, and so on. That red line is looking a bit wiggly, especially at the start. And those green uh, arrows point to when the BCH uh, network hard forked in difficulty adjustment updates. So the story seemed to be at the time that they were trying to incentivize miners to come over to the minority chain by offering outsized rewards above and beyond what they might Excuse excuse me, sparkling water, uh, what they otherwise might expect. And um, some people thought that was kind of an attack vector, that they were trying to kind of gum up the Bitcoin network by redirecting the, the hash rate. But I mean, you know, in the fullness of time, we can see that that hasn't really worked. I mean, that picture in the bottom left is the hash rate between Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash in the first year after the, after the fork. And um, we're going to now see where they are now. So the orange line is Bitcoin, and the green is BCH, ABC, and the pink line is Bitcoin SV. Now, hold on a minute. Those lines look quite close together. Oh, it's a log chart. Oops. So 
now we've got the situation where the BCH network has fragmented into two constituent progeny, two, two, two children, um, and you know, whether or not they're still fighting each other, hash warring or dumping each other's coins, is, you know, we don't, I don't know that for sure. But what we can see is that the Bitcoin network commands 50 plus times the hash rate of each of the minority networks. So one Bitcoin mining pool has enough, well, most of the top five, let's say the top five Bitcoin mining pools have enough hash rate to um, majority attack BCH or BAB and do reorgs. Now, the question is, if it's so easy to do, why hasn't it been done? And there was a conversation with a very esteemed gentleman that's in the audience today that spoke the other day. And uh, so Mr. Hoddle asked, do you think that Bitcoin SV can be an immutable ledger? And uh, not so fast said, I think SV can store something that isn't worth adulterating. Call it immutability by economic relevance. And I said, immutability. So th that's the question with these minority networks. What's the incentive for attacking them? I don't think there's a short market on Bitcoin SV. Correct me if I'm wrong. I know there's a short market on BitMEX for BCH, for ABC, but I don't know about for SV. So having a short market might help you incentivize. It gives you a reason to try and disrupt the network and attack it. But then come back to ETC. ETC was 51% attacked, quite long chain reorganizations. Price didn't really get affected that much. The market doesn't seem to think that 51% attacks and double spends on exchanges signal the death of a network as a, you know, as a, uh, as a valuable entity. At least it seems that way for now. OK. So speaking of ETC, they've now implemented this interesting, um, it's kind of like a burglar alarm or something like that. It's like a status, a live status network um, monitor. And so they're trying to see if uh, miners are building up hash power in secret or there's the risk of reorgs, risk of 51% attacks. So what was interesting, and I participated on the, the call, the post-mortem of the ETC um, community after the, after the attack, and they seem to think that most of the hash rate wasn't rented. This hash rate came from somewhere else. Now, we know that there's FPGAs running uh, FHash, and we know that various mining uh, manufacturers have announced Ethereum uh, FHash uh, ASIC hardware. I don't know if any of it's commercially available yet, but it's certainly been announced. And we've seen from the past that when these things get announced, it usually means that they're being lightly tested by the manufacturers. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, there may be the prospect that a lot of uh, ASIC F hash is about to come online. And that may make a lot of other chains start to look a little bit shaky. And there's even some talk in, in certain circles in the F hash ecosystem that um, the daddy, Ethereum, might be next up for a, for a, for a, a dance with the devil, let's say. OK, so we're going to talk about a different kind of forking operation called a fork merge. And um, this is a way that you can take two chains and turn them into one. And uh, this is kind of a Frankenstein monster operation. And it was done um, about a year and a half ago with, uh, so there was a coin called Z Classic. There is a coin called Z Classic. And that was a code-based fork of Zcash, where they removed the founder's reward, the dev tax. And Zcash was originally a descendant of Bitcoin with some additional cryptographic constructions in it. So Z Classic had, inserted into it the UTXO set of Bitcoin. So you take the UTXO set of, of Bitcoin, put it into Z Classic, and Bitcoin Private is born. And so what they did was quite interesting. So Z Classic was this quite new network that hadn't had a halving yet. Only 3 million of the 21 million coins issued. Bitcoin, um, Bitcoin had 16 and a bit million coins issued, so let's say 17. So by putting these two things together, you ended up with a network which had 20 million of the 21 million issued. So that's interesting because then this is kind of like a full ledger. There's no coins left for the miners. So if there's no coins left for the miners and the fiat token price isn't super high and this thing is on Equihash, which is an ASIC, uh, ASICs are available for Equihash, then you've got the situation where um, it's, kind of a, it's, it's kind of something we haven't seen before. So by synthetically creating this, this Frankenstein monster chain, we ended up with a coin that's a halving ahead of Bitcoin. So Bitcoin is the oldest, right? We know that. And it's between its second and its third halving. But Bitcoin private is already halving ahead of it. So this is giving us a little window into a possible future of Bitcoin. Now, people talk about what do we do when the coins run out in Bitcoin, when the mining subsidy halves a few more times and there's not enough left for the miners to, to be incentivized to defend the network. You know, electricity bills have to be paid. So maybe the transaction fees will rise. 
Maybe the fiat token price will rise. Maybe they won't. So Bitcoin private is the data point where none of those things happen. It's kind of like the nightmare future of Bitcoin. And we're going to see it's actually even more than that. It's even more of a nightmare than that. So here's a price chart. Um, look at this wonderfully unnatural chart. Um, so the, the, the run-up at the start was when Z Classic got forked into Zencash. And that did not go well. And um, there was some reorgs and some wipeout risk. And so you know, Z Classic dumped into the ground, looked pretty dead for a while. And then uh, the person that created Z Classic came back around and again and said that he was going to do this uh, Bitcoin private thing. And so they had a 100x or so pump in USD price. He timed it very well. It was the time when uh, altcoins had their um, flourishing rally at the end of the last market cycle. So he, they, they got their 100x. And then you know, at the time of the snapshot, snapshot fork, um, the thing dumped into the ground. Um, and then much later, Bitcoin private listed on HitBTC. And um, that's the purple line in the, in the corner. And well, I mean, you can't see very well the, 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 the price action here, but um, yeah, it's not, it's not going great. And I know that the bear market is, is pretty brutal for, for everything, but this is particularly interesting. So here's a, here's a close up. And now one of the things that Bitcoin Private talked about in their white paper was the possibility that this full ledger was not going to, be, was not going to work. So they had this idea that they might uh, burn some inactive UTXOs, burn some old coins that hadn't moved since the fork. Now, this is kind of a bit ironic because they were invoking the trope of Satoshi's vision. And of course, the most inactive UTXO sets are the ones that were mined at the start of the Bitcoin network. So I guess Satoshi's vision is burning Satoshi's coins. Don't know about that. So anyway, um, the problem was that some of these coins that were beginning to be burnt belonged to, or they were in the possession of HitBTC, the only major exchange that listed Bitcoin private. So they didn't like that. They said that violated their terms and service. And despite the fact that uh, Bitcoin private some people associated with Bitcoin Private paid half a million dollars in BTC to list on HitBTC. They got delisted. So it's kind of, it's getting worse, right? It's getting worse. And so now that's kind of where we are with HitBTC. Um, there's not really any exchanges, major exchanges. I mean, maybe it's on some DEXs or something like that, but there's not really any volume. The uh, last summer when I was first doing this work, I was uh, petitioning the very awesome uh, on-chain analytics um, uh, concern, coin metrics, into running a BTCP node. Yeah, to run a node so that we could get some of their on-chain um, metrics from it. And they said no at the time, but I'm glad they did it eventually because they found the, that when the fork merge was conducted, somebody stuck a couple of million extra coins into the shielded pool. And uh, so they did also did another hard fork to burn those coins, or just they burned all the shielded pool. So whether you were the attacker or not, your, your coins got burned as well. So this is really like the lesson of how not to coin. Like, uh, don't do the opposite of this, please. OK, so coming back to our analogy, the stellar analogy in the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, I've been calling Bitcoin Private a white dwarf chain. So the UTXO merge left us with a full ledger. The mining subsidy is not enough to defend the chain. There's no transaction fee market. The hash rate is tiny. When I wrote the paper, to do the 51% attack was a few hundred bucks an hour, 600 bucks an hour. Now it's 20 bucks an hour. Like, so you, know, you can work in McDonald's and pay, pay for your 51% attack with that. So there's really no value proposition here, whether you're interested in a store of value or medium of exchange. Um, the economic gravity is, is kind of disappearing. Uh, we talked about the fork pre-mine, the burning of the UTXOs, the delisting, wrecked. Very wrecked, indeed. Anyway, so I hope that you know, I've kind of motivated this idea that these, the way of, of, of comparatively analyzing these blockchain forks is kind of um, you know, combining that with the deterministic coin supply schedule of something like Bitcoin means that we can see these blockchains as kind of like time machines. So Bitcoin Private gave us a data point into, the, into a possible future of Bitcoin, just like the Hertzsprung-Russell uh, taxonomy gives you an insight into the possible futures of stars. So let's wrap that one up with a couple of nice tweets where, you know, that's me chasing clout from last year where I was talking about this stuff. Anyway, so this is the work that I've been mostly preoccupied with in the last few months. And this is really born out of frustration with the lack of regulatory certainty in the space. Uh, and, you know, this very loose use of language, very loose ethical behavior of a lot of projects, trying to paint something as red when in fact it's green. And um, so I'm trying to find ways that we can compare and contrast these assets to try and um, 
clear up some of this regulatory opacity, some of this lack of clarity in the, in, in the, the world of cryptocurrency. So we know that crypto assets are kind of a new thing. They're different to what we've seen before. They're hybrids of monies, commodities, even securities like stocks. Um, there's no counterparty liability. The value proposition models that people would use in the past for things like stocks or things like uh, um, yeah, monetary value, they don't really work here. People have been trying to apply them. It doesn't really work. So it's good that people are starting to build, to build better heuristics. Like, you know, market cap is kind of seems to be on the way out now. People are looking for better metrics to try and understand these things. So we know that these things are networks, protocols, and monetary assets at the same time. And that complicates matters for people from the legacy structures because uh, we've got this kind of hybrid thing going on. It's, uh, it depends how you look at it and who looks at it as to what they see. So we've had this kind of regulatory dance in America where the Commodity and Futures Commission, Trading Commission, the Securities and Exchange Commission, uh, FinCEN and all, all the others, they see what they regulate inside these assets. So therefore they think that they should be regulating these assets. And the reality is these things are hybrids. These things are kind of, 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 of morphs of these different properties. So if we think of these things as networks, I mean, I guess some of you have probably heard of, of Metcalfe's law. And if not, you've probably heard of Moore's law. So Metcalfe's law is the idea that the value of a network roughly is roughly proportional with the square of the number of, of nodes or the, or the you know, pervasiveness of that network. So think about a telephone line. When um, Alexander Graham Bell uh, rang his mother on the first telephone line, it's probably not that valuable, right? It's, except to him. I'm sure his mother was very dear to him. But as the telephone network starts to proliferate, then it becomes more valuable. And you know, now we end up with the internet where everyone's piped into the internet 24-7. You can't put a value on that. That's literally a priceless, priceless network. But the idea of going proportional to the square of something doesn't really work, because this will just continue to infinity. And that's kind of absurd after a while. So there's a couple of researchers called Nick Gogarty and Paul Johnson. Nick Gogarty works on SolarCoin. And they've come up with this idea of a valuation th a theory for network capital. And this is really cool, actually, in my opinion. So the idea is that the price of an asset as part of a network, and you can think of all monies as protocols and all monies as networks. So the pounds in your pocket only work because the person on the other end of the transaction is willing to accept it. The Visa card only works if the merchant accepts Visa. Bitcoin only works if you can motivate the person you're buying something from to accept Bitcoin. So the way that um, Gogarty and Johnson are trying to value these things is by using these different um, parameters. So the price can be is a function of the redemption utility. And for, for, a, for a money, the redemption utility can be to spend it. If, the, if it's a piece of gold, then you could be using that for an industrial purpose as well as spending it. If it's a fish, you redeem it by eating the fish. Right? So it's about using the, using the thing. The network utility, as we said, it's about how pervasive the, the, the protocol network is. And the speculative utility, I think you're probably all familiar with speculative utility if you're in this room, is you know, the idea that this thing might be worth something different than it's worth now. And you can also think about this through the lens of time. So everyone knows the price of Bitcoin yesterday. Or if they don't, they can look it up. Yeah, that's recorded. That's objective. We, we know what the price was yesterday. The price today is intersubjective. So it depends on a series of factors in that moment. And the price tomorrow, we don't know. We're guessing. We're reading tea leaves. So um, we're moving from the objective to the intersubjective to the, to the subjective. I really recommend people check out this, this work. There's also a talk that uh, Paul Gogarty, Nick Gogarty gave at a token engineering meetup online. Quite a long talk. Really, really good. And he's got a book as well, by the way. So. I think I'm preaching to the choir here that uh, you know, we're not here building Tulips 2.0. Um, Aristotle has been talking about the qualities of good money for you know, since the fourth century BC, portability, fungibility, divisibility, uh, intrinsic value. Jevons was talking about store of value, medium of exchange, unit of account. And so these seem to be kind of a bedrock from which people, someone could formulate a theory of what makes a good money. OK, so here I'm going to introduce uh, my project called Token Space. And this is kind of um, inspired by the idea of taxonomy. Now, taxonomy is this idea of bringing structure and order to a collection of objects. So the first taxonomies were really natural, categorizing natural objects. So I think of how many legs does an animal have? Does it suckle its young? Does it have hair? Tell the difference between an insect and an animal and a, and a mammal and uh, uh, arachnid and, and, and so on. 
So, I told you I was a science nerd before, so that's, that's going to come up later. Now, why is it important? Okay, so the regulators are here. Part, party seems to be on pause at the moment while the regulators sort out, you know, satisfy themselves that things are, things are going okay. So, yes, I don't know who the ice king is in the regulatory world. You'll have to, you'll have to figure that one out and let me know. So uh, last year, one of the uh, senior uh, officials at the Securities Exchange Commission in the United States, William Hinman, made some comments that he thought that, you know, it's already been kind of done and dusted that Bitcoin's not a security. There's no leader, there's no people that you rely on, there's no expectation of profit in the sense that one Bitcoin always equals one Bitcoin. Now, Ethereum's different because Ethereum did a token sale. So when you do a token sale, then you're motivating people on the speculative utility. There's the promoters of the, of the token sale. There's, there's an Ethereum foundation. There's a Bitcoin foundation too, but it's not really the same situation. It seems to be more of, a, more of a joke than anything else. So if you think about this sufficiently, he said that Ethereum is now a sufficiently decentralized network that it's no longer a security, but at the time of the token sale, it likely was a security. Now, those comments are interesting, but they're not very helpful for any other project, because how do they know where they sit on this? Like, are they inside the line of what a security is, or are they outside it? Because if they're inside what a security is, then these guys are going to want to regulate them. And if they've been issuing un unregistered securities, people are starting to go to jail for this stuff in the States at the moment already. And I think there was some, some stuff in Canada, the Munchie token was a Canadian thing, and some people went to jail there as well, so, or, or something. Some bad, bad stuff happened. Anyway, so... Uh, I used to be a science nerd. This was my mentor at university, Professor Martin Polikoff. He's now like a YouTube famous uh, 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 chemistry dude, the periodic table of the videos. He's got a million subscribers. So I used to sit in his office and play with dog toys to look at the shapes of molecules and stuff. Now, this guy is probably the biggest aficionado of uh, elemental taxonomies in the world. He's got that in the bottom right. That's a rack of ties of the periodic table. He used to just have one when I was there. And now he's got literally a rack of ties. People just bring them to him. And he came up with the idea for the International Year of the Periodic Table this year because it's the 150th year since uh, Mendeleev had his uh, dream of, of uh, structuring um, the, the periodic table. And this is a periodic table carved into one of his uh, distinctive wiry hairs. So that's the smallest periodic table in the world. And that's him getting his uh, knighthood from some guy. Okay. So this is, the, this is the periodic table of the elements. You've probably all seen it. You've probably seen it above the chemistry teacher at school. And, uh, but it didn't start off in this kind of finished state, in this you know, ordered state where uh, elements are, are, are ranked and, and structured according to their similarities of reaction and then uh, graded in, in uh, rows by their mass. No. It started off with Newton. And Newton was pretty much an occultist, you know, as well as a brilliant mathematician. He was there trying to essentially reverse engineer gold to see if it really was provably scarce, to see if you could uh, just uh, cr create it out of less valuable materials. So the periodic table took a long time to refine from you know, the elemental nitre and air and water and fire into looking at empirical, like experimentally determined similarities and differences of, of elements based on what they react with. And you know, then the um, Dalton came up with, oh, here in Manchester, Dalton came up with the atomic theory and verifying Democ Democritus's work in, in uh, uh, several centuries BC. And then, um, gosh, I think I might have got that wrong. Anyway, as technology developed, people figured out the atomic structures, electrons uh, are responsible for, for bonding and, and creating ch chemical uh, compounds. And then the taxonomy, the periodic table, kind of took structure over a period of time. Rutherford, Rutherford and Dalton, I'm sorry. Sorry, guys. So by contrast, by, by comparison with this nicely formed periodic table of the elements, this is kind of where we are now with taxonomies in the cryptographic asset space. And uh, we're still in this, I'm sorry to say, we're still in the occult period here. People don't really know what's going on. On the left, it's from the IMF, that you know, legacy financial institution. You'd think they'd have some smart people there. But I mean, by the definition of taxonomy, this is not even a taxonomy. I call it a sunflower. It's a very rudimentary. So, um, and on the right, you have something from a Brave New Coin, and they've taken quite a good stab at trying to figure out a way to um, understand similarities and differences of these things. They've called it a taxonomy. I think what they've really developed is kind of a library, a data bank of all the different characteristics of these networks. Okay, so coming back to this idea of the sufficiently decentralized Ethereum test. Now, we spoke about securities, we spoke about monies, and we spoke about commodities. So, what I've done is I've built a kind of imaginary construction, an idealized 3D space, which I call token space. 
where each of the axes, the x, y, and the z axes, represent the extent to which an asset exhibits the properties of a security, a money, or a commodity. And once you've got a 3D space, then you've got a picture. You've got a pictorial visual representation that you can plunk these things in, and you can show that to somebody that's not technical, that's not familiar with these assets, and they can start to make reasoned, comparative judgments of things. Now, I will just preface all of this by saying this is quite subjective work. So what you're likely looking at is a projection of my biases. So if you don't agree with it, that's fine. You can make your own token space. Um, and that's really the point. I built a framework which somebody like a regulator or a lawmaker or a, somebody that works in a compliance and exchange or, um, or an asset issuer could use to try and fine tune the characteristics of their assets and their networks in order to avoid any possible future headaches. Okay, so this is a, a kind of hypothetical regulatory boundary function. So when we said that the guy from the SEC said that we think that Ethereum is sufficiently decentralized now, you can imagine that Ethereum started off above that line in the red zone, in the danger zone, and as time's passed, it's passed through this boundary under this kind of danger zone into the everything's cool zone. Maybe not everything's cool, but some things are cool. Okay. So this is kind of what the, one of the taxonomies looks like. Um, you don't, tables are terrible for talks, I'm sorry in advance, but um, there's, no, there's no way to dress it up. So each of the rows is a different, we call it a dimension, a different characteristic. So I'll read some of them out because it might be a bit small. Things like, uh, is there profit sharing or cost reduction if you hold the asset? Is there rights to cash flows like staking or masternodes? Uh, are there any investor expectations or marketing claims? What's the issuance mechanism? Is it proof of work, proof of stake, arbitrary burn, snapshot, fork, airdrop? How is the governance conducted? Uh, is it, are there any permissioned or proprietary elements? Uh, how easy is it to run a node? Uh, how backwards compatible is the, is the software? And each of these things gets scored, and then each of these dimensions gets weighted, and that collapses all of this stuff down into one number, which produces your coordinate on one of these axes. On these axes. So, then this is some sample figures that I've, I've pulled out from, from the paper. Paper's almost ready, so um, if anyone wants to proofread a 50-page 50, 50 manuscript, please let me know. Um, and so here I've tried to kind of compare and contrast some crypto assets with some legacy assets. So we know that Apple stock is a share, it is a security, it's kind of like, that's what it is. So give that securityness of one. And you could say that a lump of gold, that is definitely not a security, so we can give that securityness of zero. Then everything else can kind of fall in between it depending on its characteristics at that moment in time. Okay, so, and you can see here, I've tried to tease apart the differences in Ethereum between um, the birth of the network and how it is now. So obviously more people are using the network, it's more, the asset is more useful, the network is, is uh, the participants of the network are more distributed, and so it's less like a security. As time goes on, uh, the network matures, that's the hope. So that's one other thing to think about, is that um, at the start, all of these things look pretty centralized. You know, it, when it was Satoshi and Hal, that's centralized. It's just two guys, you know. So um, if these things are going to be regulated meaningfully, we're going to have to think about some kind of grace period or some kind of Hail Mary zone or something like that. Otherwise, it doesn't really make sense. How would you ever be able to issue one of these things without it looking like a security? Um, even a fair launch proof of work coin it still looks pretty centralized in terms of its um, characteristics compared to as the network uh, grows and matures. Okay, right. So there's more of this. This is for moneyness. That's for commodityness. Let's, let's get back to the pictures. All right. Here's a picture. Token space of top 10 assets by market cap. So on the, you've lost the axes. So the, X, the bottom axis is commodityness. The depth axis is moneyness. And the up axis is securityness. So you can kind of see that Bitcoin's out on its own. Um, and I think that's probably to be expected, you know, having been around so much longer. We know there's no leader. Otherwise, shit would get done. You know, nothing gets done in Bitcoin because there's no leader. People try. People try to take over Bitcoin or try to nudge it and influence it. It doesn't really work. And, uh, okay, so next up is Ethereum. It's less of a money than Bitcoin. I think, you know, it'd be hard to disagree with that, really. Um, it's still quite useful. So it has some commodityness. But because of its, its past and because of its, the increased requirements to, to run a node and be a participant of a network, it is a bit more security-like, let's say. Then, you know, moving into the middle, we've got um, BCH and LTC, and they look pretty similar. And you'd expect that. They're proof-of-work networks. There are 
important people, foundations or big players, but it's, um, it's, not, um, it's not a million miles away from, from a Bitcoin type situation. Hmm. And, um, we've got a little kind of gathering of uh, Stellar and, and Ripple. And I, th I guess, again, you'd kind of expect them to, to sit quite close to each other, given the similarities in their provenance and their history, and also um, a lot of the inside the token supply is held by insiders in both cases. I mean, Ripple Labs has some huge amount of the coins, and it's even more the situation with, with uh, Stellar. And I don't know how many of you heard recently about the uncovered inflation bug in Stellar. So about some huge amount, 20%, 25% of XLM supply was um, uh, created you know, um, fraudulently or you know, uh, through a bug um, in 2017, and nothing was said. It's only just come out now because Misari wrote a report about it. And the Stellar Foundation just burned the coins to, manage, to balance the supply. They didn't tell anyone. Does that sound decentralized to you? I don't know. I'm not saying anything. OK, and then the last cluster is uh, Binance Coin, Tron, and EOS. And these, you know, they did very high profile token sales, or they're very centralized. I mean, Binance Coin is on one exchange. And I don't think you can short it. I'd like to short it. I don't think you can. Um, and so they're, they're very security like. So, Binance Coin, you get fee reduction if you hold the coin. So, that's kind of like a, an, a right. You're getting a right to, to a. To a service by holding the coin. Um, and EOS, you get airdrops by holding it. So these things all they look like capital assets. You're getting kind of revenue or cash flows. Um, side note on things like proof of stake. Proof of stake is kind of analogous to passive investing. You're getting cash flows from holding an asset. Um, so that makes something a bit more security-like. Masternodes make something look a bit more security-like. You're getting rights to these on-chain cash flows. Anyway, let's move on. So once you've got the points in the space, you can start to do some kind of like statistical and numerical analysis. What I've done here is what's called k-means nearest neighbor clustering. So you can kind of use mathematical, mathematical properties to try and see the similarities and differences of these things in the space. So um, I'm getting to hurry up now, so I better, better crack on. And then I've done some hierarchical clustering, which is kind of like a sorting machine, where you feed the, the, the assets into the space, and it's kind of looking for the um, sorting them on the basis of their similarities and their differences. OK, better dash on. This is time dependent. It's very busy, because I've tried to plot eight assets and, over, and evolving over time. Um, so I won't go into it too much. But you can kind of see the evolution of, say, gold is becoming less money-like and more commodity-like as, as time goes on. Ethereum is becoming less security-like, uh, and so on. Become, Bitcoin is becoming more money-like, and, and so on. So, OK, let's talk really briefly about hidden power structures in monetary networks. So we know that these networks have this kind of delicate balance of stakeholders. You, know, you have exchanges and economic nodes, miners, users, and, and, and so on. And if this thing is balanced, then you kind of, kind of have a healthy network. If they're not balanced, then things can go south very quickly. So what we were promised was this. We were promised utopia. And what we got was more like this. Yeah, oligarchy. So um, these recent conversations about on-chain governance and plutocracy, um, you know, insiders having huge amounts of influence and sway in these networks, um, people that know how the systems work, gaming them and, and uh, taking advantage of, of, of their knowledge to, to, to gain an advantage. These things are all very, very present in these networks. And it's very hard to, to not see them pretty much everywhere. I mean, you could even argue that Bitcoin is somewhat of a developer technocracy. We have to trust Bitcoin Core. We have to trust cryptographers that they have created these constructions correctly. So none of these things are perfect. Um, so there's, there's, this is ongoing work. And I've been looking in particular at asymmetries in multi-tier node systems like master nodes. So we've seen some dictatorships, cartels, mafia wars. All the stuff that we see in our regular everyday life. Yeah, we've, we've replicated all of that. So I won't go too much into the rest of this stuff. Um, but I will say that uh, yeah, De Beers, I'm going to let you finish, but EOS made the best Insta cartel of all time. So D DPoS inherently leads itself to cartelization. It's, it's, it's like a recreation of representative democracy, of parliamentary democracy. And so the insiders uh, have a lot of power, and then they can use that power to kind of gang up on subsets of, of stakeholders within within the, the, the validator cartel. So it's, it's a lot of problems with DPoS. OK, you know about the DAO. I won't talk about that. Unstoppable applications, yep. OK, so let's talk 
for the last few minutes about humanitarian political potential of things like Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. So my family's originally from Iraq. Bad guys showed up, took all our stuff. My family had to leave. So this thing is quite real for me. Um, and I, I, there's a little initiative that I call Reaching Everyone, which we use to try and raise awareness of all the developments of, of technology and um, things that people are doing in the space to remember, because we're the 1% in this, in this world, we're the early adopters, and this stuff is still being built. As Naval said, no one has missed the boat in cryptocurrency, we're still figuring out how to build the boat. So what we must make sure is that we don't forget everyone else as we're building this stuff. And there's a, there's a whole world out there of people that don't have the access to infrastructure, opportunities, capital, and um, we've got to make sure that they can benefit from this stuff too. Because remember, we have the potential to use this stuff for fairness, to empower the individual. So let's please remember, please remember that. So there's things like the Blockstream satellite, which is beaming down transaction data from a series of geostationary uh, satellites. That means if your internet is censored, you can still pick up blocks. If the, if the government is sniffing your packets, you can still sync your nodes without them knowing. And this is now covering 90 plus percent of the world's population. Things like... Uh, uh, Go tenors, which are mesh networking devices, mean that if your internet is down, you can hop through a mesh network through censored territory to get towards uh, somewhere where somebody can broadcast your transaction to the internet. People have built relays for SMS, for mesh. My buddy built uh, a radio that broadcasts Morse transactions in Morse code. Re re like, it's just limited by your imagination, seriously. It's really, really interesting. So a shout out to Polymerbit, who are, uh, you know, have got a stand out at the back. These are kind of prepaid off-chain vouchers. So if you don't have internet, this is a way that you can, like, you know, you preload an open dime, you can transact with this. Now, there's some non-trivial problems with verifying that, you know, you definitely have what's, on, what's supposed to be on here if you haven't got internet. But we must keep thinking about these things. So I don't know how widely a lot, a lot of you have traveled, but if you go somewhere like rural India, when your bus or whatever arrives, you get to a place, even if it's just a you know, series of shacks with a clearing in a forest, there's usually a person with a table selling GSM top-up vouchers. So I think that's kind of the way that everyone else is going to get, going to get on board with the minimum viable infrastructure of, of these things. So hardware wallets, uh, voucher systems, like uh, Danny from Fast Bitcoins was here yesterday. And um, this is a van that travels around South America with a satellite on the top, La Bitcoinetta, teaching people how to use Bitcoin in rural locations. Uh, that's Coinshore, a Kiwi, who um, did some uh, kind of anti-censorship testing with, with GoTenners. My buddy Matt, who did uh, the Morse code, broad, Morse, Morse code broadcast. Laura is a really interesting um, protocol for medium to long range transmission. Nick Zabo and Elaine, Elaine Uwe are working on a weak radio uh, transmission with, uh, with a software defined radio to reach deep in, into censored territories. And I'll leave you with this um, recent tweet from Passport Capital which was looking at the difference in local Bitcoin trading volume between the first world and the developing world. So in the first world, the, the, the USD denominated volume has followed the price. So the volume has re remained relatively constant in BTC terms, and it's fallen with the price in USD terms. But in developing countries on the orange line, in emerging and frontier markets, it has not fallen as much, which is suggesting that there is more peer-to-peer -peer transaction activity going on through local Bitcoins, at least, um, uh, even though the market is depressed and people aren't thinking so much about Lambos and Moon and getting rich. So Bitcoin is useful. These things are useful and people are starting to use them. And that's really important in my opinion. Okay, that's pretty much it. So I just wanted to wrap up, say thank you very much for your time. I'm an independent researcher, so if you uh, want to discuss this stuff, feel free to get in touch. If you know how we can get funding, that would be really, really helpful. Um, and uh, the slides are available at the link at the bottom, secretlivesmcr.pldl.com. And thanks very much, and hopefully there's a bit of time for some questions. A round of applause for that. <laughs> lots of models, lots of charts, lots of diagrams. Three-dimensional graphs is what we're like. Uh -huh. that's, that's a whole new d dimension. It is actually a new dimension, isn't it? We used to look at things on an X, Y axis. Uh -huh. but I like your moneyness commodity yeah. and security <laughs> yeah, The thing with those graphs is they're not that clear because um, there's so many points on them. Right. But if you have to line down to the, the XY plane, yep. then you can see where it sits. That's where you see Bitcoin way out field. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So actually, there are ways of plotting things in higher dimensionality. So people that do machine learning are used to very high dimensionality data sets. So you've got like radar maps and mm -hmm. all kinds of a TSNE, all kinds of crazy stuff. So you could do, 
You could build your own token space with a bazillion dimensions. I'm not saying it makes sense, but you could build a much higher one. Yeah, the 3D do. thing, you can give it to a regulator and say, look, this is similar, this is different, you know? We should stick a VR headset on the regulator and say, right, this is the token space. Bitcoin's way out. And I noticed it was only like 0.45 as moneyness. Well, if so you it, compare, so in that one, I compared it to, say, something like Swiss francs. Right. So compared to Swiss francs, I mean, or it's, USD. It's Swiss franc of 1.0 on, on moneyness. It, it, I mean, I, I put it there for the, for the purposes of having something at that end, because I don't right. think the USD is the best money around anymore. So You don't? That's my opinion. I just quick throw that out there. Yeah. Okay, cool. Don't shoot me. Uh, we've got time for one question before Ethbits comes and does their talk, everyone. Here we go. Hello, thank you for a very interesting presentation. I'm very curious, <clears throat> what is your take on Bitcoin becoming the international reserve currency? Do you think it's realistic? And yeah, could you elaborate on why okay. you think so? No, it's a good question. So I think uh, for me, like, if we take apart the possibility, the unlikely but poss still non-zero possibility that uh, the thing just breaks, you know, quantum cryptography, we can't get something in like that, quantum computers break ECDSA or, or SHA-256. I think for me, the worst case scenario is that Bitcoin will be a strategic asset like gold, like oil, uh, like uranium, something like that, something that governments will begin to accumulate and uh, kind of um, bustle their elbows with each other. Uh, we may already be seeing that with countries that are being uh, excommunicated from the international banking system. So North Korea is not on SWIFT. Iran's being kicked off SWIFT. Venezuela is off SWIFT. SWIFT is this American kind of banking clearing system. If, you get, if you're not America's friend, you're not welcome anymore. So uh, as for a currency, like in terms of everybody using it every day for, for buying their bread, I'm, I'm not sure. I don't know. I mean, maybe things like Lightning Network re re relieve the transactional friction of operating on the chain. And they may mean that the fees on low value transactions um, make it possible that everyday transactions could happen even if the on-chain fees get really high, as they probably need to, to avoid the Bitcoin private type tragedy. Um, so it's a, it's a great question. I don't know the answer. I mean, I'd like to see that, but uh, I'm just some guy with opinions. I don't know. All right, we're on final round of applause for Wasim, please.